All right, so tonight's sermon, I'm going to try to, um, hopefully it'll be a little edifying for you, but I also want to challenge you, as uh, is pretty frequent around here. I'm always looking to, to challenge the, all the members of our church, and we're going to be talking about a real simple, basic truth, and basically that has to do with your thoughts, and, and what I want to try to get across, is, and to help you with maybe, is to establish your thoughts, get your get your your mind kind of under control, so to speak, and to help determine, you know, because our, what we think about in our thoughts will determine our actions. So we need to be able to identify what actions do I want to take with my life. And this comes down to your own priorities, your own personal beliefs, your convictions. What If you were to look back on your life and say, man, I wish I had done this, this, or this, or maybe you're not even that far along to, to have it spelled out to just say, well, I wish I would have done more. And I don't even know what that is, right? I don't want anyone to be in that situation at the end of their life. I think it's a bad spot to be in, and hopefully you agree. I mean, if you're sitting in the church tonight, you probably agree with me. Yeah, I don't want to just look back at my life and just be like, man, I don't know what I even really did. I wish I would have done more. And just the fact that you're not even thinking about, man, I wish I could have I done this and this and this and this shows how far back you are as far as even getting any of that stuff done. If it takes you all your life and you still don't even know what things you could have done, that's, it's a shame. It's sorry. It's, it's too bad. Now, you have to choose right, just right off the bat what you decide is important. Right? Whatever your most important things are in your life, however you establish that in your own life, in your own mind, is the way you know, your actions ought to reflect that. And Hopefully tonight's sermon will help you to get the things done that you do want to get done, the things that you do have a desire to do, the things that you kind of want to or wish you can do that just end up falling flat on their face and you don't ever end up doing it. I don't know about you, but I've got plenty of those things, but I'm working to try to get those things done and get them accomplished. There's been so many things, even since, just personally, since I've started this church, that I've been wanting to do with the church. I've been wanting to do this. I've been wanting to do that. Well, it's one thing to want things. It's another thing to do things. But part of getting things done and actually accomplishing goals and accomplishing tasks starts right up here. It starts with how often you're thinking about things, how much you've already prioritized them, and how much you just allow stuff to just get out of your mind and just go away. Because nothing that you do in the Christian life, when it comes to doing like a service or a work for God, is going to happen by accident. It just doesn't just all of a sudden happen on its own. You got to work for it. You got to make it work. Now, I've got a few steps here, and I'm just going to try to ho hopefully lay things out in a way that makes sense. The Bible says in Proverbs 24, 9, the thought of foolishness is sin, and the scorner is an abomination to men. So you know, I use this frequently out soul winning just to, to kind of demonstrate sometimes that people don't realize how many sins there are in the Bible, and how easy it is to sin, and how, you know, uh, how, how oftentimes we have an inflated view of, of how good we are. When you compare that to scriptures, well, wait a minute, you know, there's this and this and this and this and this, and even the thought, even thinking a foolish thought is sin. But it's pertinent tonight because we're going to be talking about our thoughts. We don't, I mean, we don't want to sin. We don't want to do wrong. So let's try to get even this under control. This is more than just, this verse is more than just an analogy or more than just uh, showing someone, yeah, you're really sinful. Let's not just stop it. Well, yeah. I do this probably regularly. Well, let's change that. Let's fix that. Let's try to fix our thoughts. Let's try to establish our thoughts to think in the right way. Matthew 15, where we started off, look at verse number 18. Actually, we'll, we'll just read it in context here. Let's start reading in verse number um, 16. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draft? But those things which proceed out of the mouth came forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, 
blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defile not a man. So, you know, the, the Pharisees were giving them a hard time. Oh, your disciples, they're not washing their hands before they eat. As if that matters. And Jesus is like, who cares? Like, that's not what's going to defile the people. What, what, what truly defiles someone is their spirit. It's what's in their heart. And he lists off all these things. He's like, you know, these murders, adulteries, fornications, all this stuff. You know where that all starts from? It starts in your heart. Out of your heart come evil thoughts. Out of the heart come the, 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 the temptations and these lusts to get into sin. It all starts from within you. So we're going to, you know, get to the heart of the matter tonight, where things start. And, and, you know, when the Bible talks about the heart, the heart and the mind are, are pretty well linked together. Um, it's going to be hard to draw a very uh, decisive distinction between, you know, obviously the heart's not talking about our physical organ. When the Bible refers to our heart, it's talking about our inner self. It's talking about like kind of who we are, where our thoughts are generated from, you know, our mind, our heart, our soul, you know, these things all kind of work together to, to, to or, or can be used almost interchangeably as far as the source of these things. So I don't want that to confuse you. He says, out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, you know, all, the, all these wicked things, wickedness, sins, things like that, that happen start from the heart. Now, uh, turn if you to Matthew chapter 7. I'm going to read for you from 2 Chronicles chapter 12 about Rehoboam. Rehoboam, of course, was the son of Solomon. And he was the first king of Israel after Saul, you know, in the line of David, which didn't get very far, to start doing wickedly. Rehoboam did some wicked things. And... Um, the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 12, 14, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. So the reason why Rehoboam ended up doing wickedly, ended up doing, committing wicked actions and doing things that are not right is because he didn't set his heart right. He didn't prepare his own heart to seek the Lord. In, in contradiction to Solomon, remember Solomon, what did he do? When God was asking him, hey, what do you want? He had prepared his heart to seek the Lord. He was asking for good things on the inside. He is genuine. He really wanted those things. He wasn't interested in, you know, his own welfare and his kingdom to be so great and to have the, the death of his enemies and have all this money and fame and prosperity. That's not what he was interested in. That's not where his heart was. His heart was in, hey, how do I do what's right? Hey, this is a great responsibility. God, I've been entrusted with this, and this is a great people, and I'm supposed to lead these people. God, I just want to do it right. I want to be right in your eyes. That's where the starting point is. You have to have that first initial step of wanting to do right in your heart. And if you don't have that, then the rest of this sermon is going to be meaningless for you because that is the starting point is to prepare your heart to seek the Lord. And this is why so many people find themselves in sin and then wonder how they got there. Well, because you didn't even prepare your heart to seek God. When you don't prepare your heart to seek God, it, it is an action. It's something you actually consciously have to do because it doesn't just happen by chance. It's not like, oh, I'm saved. I'm automatically, you know, as some people would like to think, I'm automatically just going to give up all my sins because I've turned from my sins and I'm going to, you know. No, you have to prepare your heart to seek God. It's work. And when you don't prepare your heart to seek the Lord, your heart is prepared literally for everything else but seeking the Lord. And that's what you're going to end up doing is everything else but God's work. Matthew 7 gives a, gives a good example of this. The Bible says in verse 13, very famous passage, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Now, of course, it's talking about narrow is the way it leadeth unto life, because Jesus is the only way. And basically, every other way but Jesus is going to lead you to destruction. Anything that you want to insert as well, I want to have eternal life. I want to get to heaven. You, you have quite a diversity, quite a variety of options that you can choose from. And only one of them is right. So if you don't choose the right way, which is Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, then you're not going to get to the Father because no man cometh unto the Father but by me, he said. It's just like I was thinking about this. And one of, one of the, 
the reasons that, that prompted this is that, you know, I have a long drive to and from work and it's about an hour and 45 minutes each way. So it's a lot of car time. And there's a lot of things that I choose to get done in that time. I'm not gonna bore you with all the different things that I do, phone calls, whatever. But one of the things that I like to do is listen to the Bible. It's a good time where I have quiet time and I could, I could hear a lot of Bible. But you know, sometimes it's just too much. It just, it's just hard, it gets real heavy and it's just kind of hard to focus and say, you know, where it gets to the point where it's just like, okay, well I can't, you know, I can't really absorb anymore. I can't really listen to this anymore. So I'll, um, you know, maybe turn on the radio or I have CDs too, but I was, I was thinking about this, I, I started flipping through the radio because usually it's like real late at night, so you, you never know exactly what kind of programming is going to be on. And, you know, wickedness has many options. You start going through, especially on the FM band, you could go, seek, 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 seek. And it's just like, do you want wicked one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you know, all these things that just, it's not godly. You, you've got a wide variety. There's so many things that you can choose that's not right. And on FM, man, it's hard to find anything that even, <laughs> that's even resembles right. <laughs> there may be a couple of things out there that you could find that, that isn't bad, but you know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. There's, there's a lot of ways that you can go, just like with salvation. There's so many ways you can go to enter into destruction, and there's only one right way. Well, with anything in our life, and, and really with the right way, just in, in trying to live a righteous life, trying to live according to Scripture, there's many ways to fail. There's many ways to get into sin. There's many ways to not do what's right when typically there's going to be one way to do what you're supposed to do and obey what God has for us to do. Flip back if you would to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verse number 19. See, we need to have a single heart. If our, if our hearts are going to be prepared, it needs to be focused. If we're not focused on what we want to do, then you're open for anything, so to speak. You're, you're, you're opening yourself up to, well, I don't know, what am I going to do? And you're not, you're not focused, you're not single. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Now, this is, this is talking about two different things. It's talking about either making money, you know, wh where is your treasure going to be? Is it treasure that, that's physical on this earth, or is it treasure that you're going to have in heaven? And part of preparing your heart is thinking, what is the end result? What is the end goal? Where do I want to be at? Do I want to have treasures in heaven, or do I want to have treasures here on earth? And hey, it's the choice is up to you. If you want to have treasures here on earth, then go ahead and do that. Then you're going to be focused on doing that. You're going to be thinking about, well, how can I earn more money? And you come up with all kinds of different ways of doing that if that's your end goal. But if you, want to, if you truly want to have treasure in heaven, then you ought to start thinking about that and considering what is going to get me rewards in heaven. And have that at the forefront of your mind because if it's not something that you're normally thinking about, you won't be doing it. You're not going to be acting on it. You're just going to end up doing whatever else catches your attention, whatever else steals your focus because, let's face it, our lives can be very busy. There's all kinds of things going on. And if you don't have a plan, if you haven't made preparations, then you're going to end up doing something that you weren't thinking about at all. You're going to end up keep doing other things. Now, in this life, we need to do some form of work in order to provide, you know, especially for men to provide for our families. And when you don't have something else prepared of, well, how am I going to spend my time? What am I really focused on? What really matters to me? What do I want to get done? You'll probably just continue doing more of the same. More of the work, more of the fun, more of the, you know, whatever, whatever things that are you're accustomed to and you've already formed habits on, you'll tend to just do more of that because you don't have anything else in your mind that's going to drive you to do something different. That's going to be, you think about, hey, well, what, you know, well, I really need to get this done. You know, I mean, even with things that are not spiritual, I think about projects that I have at home. And if I know I need to do something, but then I just never think about it again, I never do it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to get done until you stumble across again and be like, oh, hey, this is broken. I need to fix that, right? 
But when, I, when, I, when something seems a little bit more important to me that needs to be taken care of, I will think about that more. Okay, well, no, I need to buy the parts for this. Okay, I need, you know, I need to do it. And then the parts, oh yeah, I, I ordered this. I need, you know, and, and you start thinking more about it. And with me, it's a lot of stuff like, okay, well, I need to get on YouTube and figure out how I'm supposed to do this now. <laughs> and then you start thinking about it and then you end up doing it. Why? Because you're thinking about it. You, you've prepared your heart, in a sense, to do a, spe a specific task. Something that you deemed to be important and needed to get done. Well, unfortunately, we tend to get distracted with all these little things and don't take a step back and look at, well, what is really important in my life? What is it? Do I want my life to be marked by? I mean, fixing things at home and being a handyman and getting things done, there's nothing sinful or wrong about that, right? And you can be very good at that, and that's, and that's fine. But do you really, I mean, when you think about, do I want to end up in my life and just say, wow, you know, I've repaired a lot of things, I fixed all these things, they're all just going to be burned up anyways? And that's what I spent the bulk of my time doing? We need, we need to have that reality check and that, and that you know, heart check of what is really important and how am I going to be spending my time on this earth? Now, obviously, with, with, with me, family is really important. I need to make sure that I am focusing and thinking about my family because that is an important thing to me. Serving God, obviously, is another important thing. You, know, you, you have your own priorities and what you think is most important in your life. And you need to prepare your heart for each one of those things. Now, it's easier to take care of your family, your thing by family, when they're right in front of your face all the time that will automatically grab your attention. It's easier for that to happen. It's easier to keep your thoughts on that when it's right in front of you. The harder thing are the things of God. And that's why we're covering this this evening because this is more difficult and it takes more concerted effort to prepare your heart to seek the Lord, to do what's right because it requires reading, it's going to require listening, going to church. It's going to require you to be doing things. One, to identify what's right. What should I be doing? And then to continue following through with that. So uh, let's, let's finish off the, what, this passage because I wasn't just stopping with where your treasure is, there is your heart also. It's a great passage. It's a good point to help us remember, hey, what is it that I really care about? And if I care more about treasures in heaven than I do on this earth, then where are you spending more of your time? You see what I mean? I mean, are you spending, investing so much time on the treasures on earth and very little on the treasures in heaven? That's not then reflective if you really, truly want your treasures to be in heaven of that priority. Well, let's keep reading. Verse number 22, it says, The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And this is something that the Bible is very clear about, that you have to make a choice. I mean, there's, there's really only one direction that you can end up taking in your life. You can't be going multiple directions all at the same time. Our time is limited, and the older I get, the more I realize this truth of how fast time just continues to go by, just day after day after day, and it's like, man, I wish there was more hours in a day. There's so much more I want to do. There's so many more goals I want to accomplish, and you know, I didn't feel this way as much when I was younger because you feel like you have your whole life in front of you, and you feel like you could waste all kinds of time because who cares? I'm young. No big deal. But I'll tell you what, I'm, <laughs> I've wasted a lot of years and looking back, what a shame it is when you re truly realize the value of time. It, it, it hurts to think about the years that have just been wasted as you get older. So just a little food for thought for the younger people in the room. But um, it's true, you can't serve two masters. You have one boss in your life. You have one authority, one one goal, one main objective in your life. Is it going to be to satisfy yourself? Is it going to be to satisfy, you know, the, the things of this world to, to make a lot of money? Is it going to be, you know, what, what is your goal? Or is it going to be more related to serving the Lord? You can't be serving both bosses at the same time. 
Turn, if you would, to uh, Jeremiah chapter 6. Jeremiah chapter 6. We need to stay focused, focused, have a single eye, and keeping our thoughts focused on what we truly want to get done. Jeremiah chapter 6. Again, this is still kind of the earlier part of the sermon. It'll still end up being a shorter sermon this evening, I'm pretty sure. But um, Jeremiah chapter 6, the first thing that we need to do is to accept the right way. If you decide, hey, I, you say, yeah, I want to follow God. I want to I do what God has for me to do. We need to start preparing our hearts by fully embracing what God has for us. Look at verse number 6 of Jeremiah chapter 6. The Bible says, For thus saith the Lord of hosts, excuse me, for thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is the, Sarah, Sarah, hush your mouth. Verse number 6, Thus hath the Lord of hosts said, Hew ye down trees and cast a mount against Jerusalem. This is the city to be visited. She is holy oppression in the midst of her. As a fountain casteth out her waters, so she casteth out her wickedness. Violence and spoil is heard in her before me continually as grief and wounds. Be thou instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from thee, lest I make thee desolate, a land not inhabited. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, they shall thoroughly glean the remnant of Israel as a vine. Turn back thine hand as a grape gatherer into the baskets. To whom shall I speak and give a warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days, and their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. We're going to continue reading here, but just real quickly, we see here Jerusalem is rejecting God, essentially. They're, they're living really wickedly. And it says that it's because their ears have, it says that he says they're uncircumcised. Because they're not open to hearing the word of God. They can't hear. He says, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have disdain for God's word. They don't even care to hear it anymore. They have no delight in hearing God's word. It's a burden to them. It's a bore. So I don't want to have anything to do with this. And the Lord's going there saying, I'm weary with holding back my wrath. Like, I'm getting pretty sick and tired of this, and I'm ready to just pour out judgment on them. And because God is still low, so long-suffering, like he still hasn't done it, and he's just like, I'm about to blow a gasket here. You need to get right with me, which is why Jeremiah is even preaching to him, you know, to, to get them right. And uh, he's, he's telling them, look, it's going to be bad. This is what's going to happen. Verse number, uh, where was it? Verse 12, let's start reading there. And their houses shall be turned on others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. So we see here, where is their heart prepared for? It's prepared for covetousness. It's prepared for the God of this world. They're serving mammon. They don't want to serve the Lord. No man can serve two masters. This is where their heart is. They care more about other people's stuff and just their own personal gain. And it says, And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. Now this is also indicative of where they're at spiritually when he says, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? 
when you're relatively right with God, when you're, when you're walking a pretty, a relatively righteous life, when you commit sin, you're going to be ashamed of that. You're going to be upset. You're going to be thinking, wow, I can't believe I did that. But when you just go off the deep end and you're just completely backslidden or whatever, you're just going to be like, well, whatever, and not care anymore. And now the, even doing an abomination, not a shame. Not even ashamed to be caught doing some abomination. You're like, yeah, I did that. This is the attitude that, that Jerusalem had at this time. And this is, this is what he's saying. This is why God is so angry. See, you're not even ashamed of your sin and your wickedness and abominations. He says, nay, they were not all ashamed, neither could they blush. Normally you blush when you're embarrassed, right? Like, oh man, I can't believe I got caught doing that. Oh man, I, I can't believe I even did that. How could I do such a thing? You get embarrassed about it. You don't want to get to this point to where your heart is so hardened that it doesn't even matter to you anymore. This is where the people of Israel were at. Uh, verse number 16, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. So God's trying to show them, Hey, look for the old path. Look at the old ways. The old ways of doing things, you'll get rest. You won't be troubled anymore. You won't have all this turmoil. You won't have all this chasing. Just look for the old path and walk therein and say, nope, we're not going to do it. Nope, we're not going to walk therein. We've heard you. We don't want to hear you anymore. In this stubborn, rebellious attitude, verse 17 says, Also I set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Therefore hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, and this is the phrase I really want to focus on from this chapter. Even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor to my law, but rejected it. The acceptance of God's word, the acceptance of God's law, is where you start preparing your heart to have that first step. I mean, we're talking about doing actions. That comes way later. The basic part is just saying, no, I hear God's law and I'm going to accept it. And here it's saying that the fruit of your thoughts by rejecting God's word is going to be this wrath and this turmoil and this heartache and, you know, and all the problems that are going to come along with it. Our thoughts will produce fruit. And if your thoughts are rejecting God's word, then it's not going to be good fruit as a result. James 1 verse 14 says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. This is exactly what this is talking about here in Jeremiah chapter 6 also. Um, you know, the children of Israel were, they were drawn away of their own lusts. They disregarded God's law. They were drawn away of their own lusts. They were enticed. They thought about that and acted that way. When lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin was finished, bringeth forth death. Now, your mind is occupied with whatever thoughts you allow in, right? Um, those are going to be the ones that you end up doing. So, like, whatever, whatever you allow into your mind, whatever thoughts you dwell on, the things that you think about regularly are going to be what you're going to end up doing. People don't just fall into sins, especially big sins. You know, people say, oh, man, I, I, I don't know how I fell into this sin. And it's like adultery or fornication or something. Oh, I just, it just happened. I don't know how it happened. Well, I'll tell you how it happened. The sins always begin with the temptation and the thoughts start going in your head about that sin before you ever end up doing it. That's the way it happened. I mean, whether it be someone, you know, especially when it comes to someone who's already cleaned up a lot of aspects of their life and have already grown spiritually to backslide or to go back, it's going to start up here. And we need to take heed lest you fall. We need to take heed to our thoughts and to our minds and to our hearts to make sure that our heart is right, that the direction we want to head is still the same, that it's still wanting to serve the Lord and that we are not going to allow 
the, the thoughts that try to creep in to give that any time in our minds and to indulge in that. Because the temptation is going to be to want to indulge in that. Because no one else can see your thoughts. God can, but we have a tendency to forget that. We don't really think about that. What people want to do, though, is, is entertain foolishness. They want to entertain the ideas of some sin, whatever is appealing to their flesh, and say, well, I'm not really going to do it, right? Because you've grown spiritually, and you, and you know, like, yeah, there's no way I want to do that again. I mean, for me, it would be, I could be thinking of, there's no way I ever want to go out and get drunk again. That would be a personal illustration for me, something I've grown really far from. But I'll tell you what, if I start entertaining this idea of thinking, hey, what would it be like to get drunk? Oh, I'm never going to do it. Never going to do it. But I start just playing in the playground of my mind and, and allowing these thoughts to come into my mind and just going down that path and thinking of old times. Oh, how fun was that when I would go out and, and get, you know, you know what's going to happen next? Then you will end up picking up that drink. Then you will go off and hide somewhere or make up some excuse and go off to the bar and get drunk. Then it will happen. Then you will find, you find yourself really backslidden and say, oh, how did I get here? It's because you allowed it to come into your mind. We need to guard our minds from, from the sin and from, and from entice, you know, the, the temptations that beset us all about. We need to learn to cut those off right away. Turn if you would to Joshua chapter number one. Joshua chapter one. So we need to set our hearts right. We also need to be mindful of God's word by keeping it in our memory, ret retaining it in our knowledge. It's one thing to come across God's commandments or you know, particular sins or whatever it is in the Bible and to see it and understand it and accept it and say, oh yeah, that's, I mean, that's what God's word says, that's true, and then just keep on going, right? Or come to church and hear something preach about and then just go home and just in one ear, out the other. It's not enough just to acknowledge it and say, yep, that's true, yep, I believe that. If you're going to keep your heart prepared. We need to, to be mindful of God's word and keep it in our memory um, you've already accepted the truth of God's word. Now you have to keep it with you. Joshua 1, verse number 7, the Bible reads, Only be thou strong and very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law. At this point, when Joshua was leading them, they'd all heard the law. They'd all heard it from Moses in the wilderness. Joshua chapter 1, they're just now going to embark in... in, in get into the promised land and, and get the, everything that God's promised them and receive those blessings, right? Now it's going to be a fight and he's telling them, look, be strong, be courageous that you might do according to, well, you've heard it all before. You've heard it. Now I want you to put it in action. Now you need to remember it and do, it says, which Moses, my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success. If you want your life to be a success, you need to prepare your heart, accept God's word, and then meditate in his word in order to be able to turn his words into actions. That's right. you, you have to have all three. So one is preparing your heart. I'm ready to accept God's word. Yes, this is true. Number two is, well, I know this is true. Now I need to keep it with me so that I know what the right thing to do even is. I'm thinking about the right things to do. I can act on them, which is the last thing, is just actually acting and actually doing, actually performing and doing what it is that you need to do. Very simple process, but um, things that we can allow to just escape our mind already. This is a great, you know, by the way, verse number eight there, Joshua 1a is a great verse to have memorized, to have meditating on in your own life, especially if you feel like you might have lost your focus. If you feel like you're at a point like, you know what, I, I think I might have lost my focus somewhere along the way where I'm just really not doing anything. 
This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt have, make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. I want my life to be a success. Meditate in God's word. Keep it fresh in your mind regularly. Keep your mind occupied with the things of God, with the prayer, with reading. Make it a daily activity that's regularly part of your schedule. You need to schedule it into your day. Carry God's word with you. Have it always available, whether you write it on a, a note card, whether you have it on your phone, whether you have a little pocket Bible with you. Make sure you always have it with you, but not just with you, but like use it. I know for a long time I carried a New Testament. Now, because I have my phone, I don't really need to do this anymore, but I always carried a New Testament in my pocket just all the time. And, for, and at first, I would actually use it. I mean, I would be using it and, and reading it every chance I get. But then it got to a point to where I always had it with me. I never used it. And what good is that? Right? There's, I mean, look, this happens. This is part of life. We need to continually be able to re-examine, refocus. You, you know, I, I'm not down on you if this is where you're at. Or if, you know, look, let's just get it right. Let's get it fixed. There's, there's always areas we're going to be slipping on and we're not really focused on and we're not thinking that much about. We need to, to continually reevaluate and reanalyze where we're at in order to, to stay on the ultimate end goal in the right path. I can't emphasize enough, though, the importance of your heart being right with God, of just making sure that, that you, you, you are your desire, because that's what's going to drive you more than anything. Does your heart really have the desire to serve God? And if not, do you want your heart to have a desire to serve God? Is that what you want? Because... It, you may just feel like, well, I don't feel like I have a desire. But I know I should. I mean, I am thankful that I'm saved. I do want to do more. You need to work at that then. Don't just throw up your hands and say, well, I don't have it. Well, you can get it. It's not something that's just, right. that, that's just you either have it or you don't, and there's nothing you could do about it. No. It's just going to require a little bit more effort and thinking and reading and, getting, you know, and, and, just, and, and maybe even just contemplating the best place to start if, you're, if you don't feel right, if you don't feel like you have a good attitude towards serving God, just think about your own salvation. Just think about how wicked some of the sins that you have committed really are. Think about it. Just go back and, and contemplate and say, you know what? I did these things. And I know what the Bible already says about those things. And I know how bad it is. And then think about but God loved me enough for Jesus Christ to go through everything that he went through and just, and just realize what happened with Jesus Christ. And you start thinking about that. Hopefully that should humble you and, and soften your heart to say, yeah, he did all of that for me. I do want to do something to show my gratitude and my respect for God for loving me so much to do all of that for me. It's a great place to start. Unfortunately, though, at this step two, kind of where we're at with, with meditating on God's word day and night and having good success, this is where you lose a lot of people. Because just having the desire usually isn't that hard. Most people will say, yes, I have a desire to do what's right. Yes, I want to serve God. Yes, it's a priority for me. Most people are at that stage. When you start getting to, well, wait a minute, meditating day and night? That sounds a little extreme to me. When you have that attitude, then don't expect good success because then you're not going to have good success. This is the formula, but you need to be willing. To, are you really willing to do it? You know, how much do you really want to serve God? That's going to be a, the, the, what it boils down to because this is where a lot of people get lost. You know, there's going to be times when you're conscious of what you should be doing and you're going to think of doing something spiritual, right? It'll, it might come to your mind, but your bitter heart's going to try to distract you. Your fleshly heart is going to try to say, oh, no, don't do that. That's too much work. Do this instead. This is more fun. There's going to be times when you need to find the strength to overcome that flesh. You're going to need to call to remember in scripture or preaching or whatever is going to motivate you 
and help you to realize what is truly important and to show your love and appreciation for Jesus. Because the, the, the draw is always going to be there to draw you away from doing the things that you want to do. Just like the Apostle Paul said, you know, the things that I, that I do, I would not. That which I would, I do not. You see, you know, he's saying the things that I really want to do, I'm not doing them. And he's explaining that it's because of the flesh. It's because my flesh continually drives me and keeps me from doing all the things that I want to do. And because doing the right thing ends up being work. And I'll just say this, don't allow yourself, don't allow yourself to end up being lame and doing nothing and just continually making up excuses for yourself. Because that is going to be a way you're going to end up saying, wow, I wish I would have done more. Don't subscribe yourself to just saying, well, I'm lame. Hopefully that, that shouldn't be good enough for you. You know, and, and this is something I, I'm always trying to remind myself. Look, I don't want to be a lame creature. I don't want to be someone who just, well, everything was just a little bit too hard for me. So I ended up doing nothing. Just like the wicked servant that said, well, here you go. I know you gave me this talent, but here, it's, I'll give it back to you. And just kind of shrug your shoulders. This is what I did with my life. It's, you, you gave me a talent and, and there you go. The Bible calls that a wicked servant, a slothful servant. That does not make God, you know, I mean, and, and there's no excuse for it. If there was an excuse for it, God wouldn't be angry about it. In that parable, the master wouldn't be angry about it. If there, was, if there was a legitimate excuse for it. The problem is, is that we want to give ourselves more excuses and, and, and tell ourselves that they're legitimate more often than they really are. Now, are there legitimate excuses for not doing things sometimes? Sure, there are. I do believe that, but I also think, I also know a human being's wicked heart and the flesh wanting us to not do what's right and allowing those excuses to multiply and grow to be a little bit more significant than they really are. I mean, think of oh, a good way to put things in perspective when you feel like, oh, I can't go to church. Oh, I can't go soul winning. Oh, I can't read my Bible. Oh, I can't fill in the blank. Whatever it is that's spiritual, whatever it is that's, that's a good thing. And then just think, well, would I do... Would, would, I, would I go here, you know, is my pain too much, is my whatever, you know, whatever, whatever the problem is, I, you know, whatever you think is saying, well, this is an excuse why I can't do this. Here's an excuse why I can't, you know, what would you do under the same circumstances? Would you go to, you know, I mean, what pleases you? I don't know. Would you go to some entertainment event? Would you, would you go and do this for X amount of dollars? Would you, go, you know, like, what, what is it that you really would do? That'll help show you how important it is. If you'd go and do something for money, oh, well, I have this errand. I have this errand to run, and it needs to be done today. So I'm willing to get up, go out, take care of this business, get this done. Oh, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not up for going to church. When you're doing almost the same exact level of work or whatever it is to do. Don't allow that to become a hindrance to you in your mind because your flesh wants to keep you from doing what's right. We need to keep our hearts right. We need to keep our minds focused and um, put into action what we want to learn. Now, we're almost done here. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. That was a little bit of a departure from, uh, from kind of the main focus of this on, our, on keeping our mind right with the, with the things that we want to do. Not only do we have to get our heart right in the sense of, well, we're going to accept God's word, we also need to be keeping his word in memory. And then the third thing is to put those words into action to not be a forgetful hearer. James chapter 1, verse 22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. 
But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Again, we saw in Joshua chapter 1 having good success, and we're seeing here someone being a doer of the work, being blessed in their deed, being blessed in the things they do, having good success. Why? Because they hear God's word and they do them. They're putting it into action. You're not just being a forgetful hearer of just saying, oh yeah, I hear that, I agree with that, move on with my life. No, we need to establish that. Um, turn through to James chapter 2. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 3, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. So one way to help you to get your thoughts right, to keep your, your thoughts focused is to just commit your works to the Lord. Say, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. While you're doing work for the Lord, it's hard to be thinking about other things than what you ought to be thinking about anyways. It's, I mean, when you're, all, like, when you're out soul winning, are you really thinking about other sins that you might have been thinking about if you would have just been sitting at home doing nothing? I mean, no way. I mean, I, I mean when I'm out there, I'm, I'm all, you know, always thinking about the things of the Lord. Always. I, mean, I, can't, I can't, I'm trying to think of a time recently that I've been out soul winning and whatever, I mean, it's hard to remember what thoughts are going on in your head when you're, when you're out there, but I'm just thinking it's like, if you're not talking to your soul winning partner, you know, oftentimes I'll end up by myself, but like I'm still thinking about church and re, you know and the things i need to do and the you know all, it's always focused on the things i need to do for god and the things that are important in that regard commit thy works unto the lord and thy thoughts shall be established now your works establishing your thought i have you turn to james 2 because I, this kind of this verse kind of reminds me of that of your works establishing your thoughts because remember what i'm teaching is that your thoughts will help direct your actions and here it's saying, commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Now, the same way I believe our thoughts are established, it's, it's, it's that completion of your thoughts. When, you, when your works are committed unto the Lord, you start it off thinking, hey, I want to do work for the Lord. You commit your works unto the Lord, and then your thoughts are established. They're cemented. They're, they are firm in place. Um, similarly, in James chapter 2, when it talks about your faith without works, right? James 2.21 says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. So here, in, in a sense, comparing it to Proverbs 16.3, Abraham's faith was established, right? Through his works. Uh, it says, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness and he was called the friend of God. Abraham got saved when he put his faith on the Lord for his salvation, when he believed on God. Because that's what Romans 4 tells us, that's what the Bible teaches us, that our salvation comes by faith. But that faith was really truly cemented or established or in, this, in what it says here is perfect, right? Complete. When he acted on that faith when he was willing to offer up his son because he had full faith in God. That was just the completion. That, that's not what saved him spiritually, but that was the perfecting of his faith. And it's the same way when you commit your works unto the Lord, it establishes your thoughts. Your thoughts have now, you thought about doing something for God, then you actually do them and that cements and, and, and solidifies and perfects your thoughts. God worked great in Ezra. You don't have to turn there. We're, all, we're almost done. Turn if you would just to Galatians chapter 5. It's the last place we go tonight. Galatians chapter 5. God gave Ezra great success during the, the second building of the temple. Ezra 7 verse 6, the Bible reads, This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests, according to the hand of the Lord, his God, upon him. So everything he asked of the king, the king granted it to him. And he's already, he's already a ready scribe. He's already been in God's word. He's been meditating on God's word as a ready scribe. And now he's going to do something for God. And he has God's hand upon him. Why? Verse 10 explains why. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Ezra prepared his heart to seek God's law, 
and then he acted on it to do it. He meditated on it. He was a ready scribe. And then God blessed all of his efforts. And Ezra got a lot done for the Lord. Ezra, I'm sure, has earned himself a lot of rewards in heaven because that is where his heart was, that's where his treasure was, and that's where his heart is. It's on that reward in heaven because he prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, to put it into action. And he meditated on those things. The Bible says in Proverbs 69, a man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. When you get your heart right, when you prepare your heart, that's when God is going to start directing the path for you to take. When you start walking and doing and say, well, I'm going to do what God wants me to do, you don't have to worry about the exact path. God will direct your steps when your heart is in the right place, when your heart is seeking the law of the Lord and when you're, and when you're diligently following and meditating and keeping that your priority. Putting the Bible into action in your life by doing good things will automatically help you get rid of bad things. And this is what I'm going to close on is just this, uh, this kind of last point here. The Bible says in Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, we're always, uh, there's always so many things going on, but if you prepare your heart just to do good, just to do what's right. So let's say you plagued with different sins in your life, right? And, you're, and maybe you've been struggling with, with getting rid of sin and you're focusing on that sin. One good way to get rid of that sin is just to say, well, I'm not going to focus on that anymore. I'm going to focus on doing what's right. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, because oftentimes people will defeat themselves in their own mind trying to overcome a certain sin and spend too much time just dwelling on it and thinking about it. I could use the sin of, of getting drunk would be a good example right? You're saved. You're like, man, I know the Bible says I shouldn't be doing this, but I still have this problem and I keep on going back to drinking and I don't know how to overcome this. And it's just like, you know, I'm thinking about it all the time. I don't want to do it. Well, look, instead of just thinking about that sin all the time, if you just thought about, well, what should I be doing? And you start filling your life. Well, here's what I should, I should be reading the Bible. I should be doing, I, I should be out sowing. I should be praying. I should be, where are you going to have the time to even think about the alcohol then? When you're walking in the Spirit, the Bible says you're automatically not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. Because only one is going to be having control at any given time in your life. You're either giving control to your flesh or you're giving control to your spirit. And the more you can make yourself walk in the Spirit by doing the things that you know are right, then you will be walking in the Spirit. And then these lusts of the flesh, they're going to go away. Now, no one is ever walking in the Spirit all of the time. Because then we would be perfect. But that is the goal. I mean, that's, that's what we're trying to achieve. So the more you can, you can act on and make yourself walk in the Spirit, these other things that you might be distracting you and you feel like you don't get victory over, they can be dealt with much easier because who has time for that? <laughs> now it's time to do a self-analysis. How is your mind occupied? How often do you have godly thoughts, things that would pertain to what God says is right, what you know God wants for you to do with your life? How often is that even present in your mind? How many things are there that you've been wanting to do in your own Christian life that you have thought about, but you simply haven't done them? Think about those things. Just, just what is it? What is it in my life that I've been wanting to do? Oh, man, it'd be great if I could do this. Oh, I really, want, I really have a heart. I really want to serve God in this capacity. I really want to do this. And you've been saying it or thinking it for a while now, and it just hasn't happened. How long have you been wanting to do them, and how often are you even thinking about it or considering it? Is it something that just comes up maybe every couple months? Like, oh, yeah, that's right. I wanted to do this. Or is it a little bit more continual? Because I'll tell you what, the more you're thinking about things, the more likely you're going to be to actually act on it. The more you're keeping it in the front of your mind. But as I said before, doing right and serving God is never going to happen by accident. And it's never going to happen in your spare time. Serving the Lord does not just whatever I have left over. Because if that's the way that you treat it, you will 
always have something else to do. And you will never have that spare time to serve God with. It needs to be made a priority. The question is, though, will you put in the effort? Will you finally deny yourself and do something for Christ and just say, you know what? All these excuses, all these reasons why I haven't gotten this done, I'm going to make a change and I'm going to do it because this is something I truly want to do. This is something I want to serve God with, and I'm, and I'm done allowing excuses to overcome me to, and make me never get this stuff done. It's easy, and I'll, I'll close on this. The Bible says in Luke 9, 23, and he said to them all, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And I'll, just, I'll, I'll close on this last example personally for me. In the four years, almost four years that this church has been around, I've always wanted to have another ministry. I've spoken about it before. I'm sure you probably heard me speak about this before. Hey, I'd really like to have this. I think we should have a nursing home ministry. I think we should go. And it's never happened. And look, I've wanted to do it, but how bad did I really want to do it? Now, and, and look, even just recently, now going off in this area in Prescott and, and, and actually finding opportunities, it would be so easy to still want to do something but to not follow through with it. It almost happened. It took me a couple weeks to call that phone number of that place that was all excited. Oh, yeah, we, you know, we have chapel. We have people. We work with Ojo. Everything just like, great, this, could, this will probably work. All it requires is taking that step and doing a little bit of work, taking out time out of my schedule to say, you know what? No, I'm going to make this happen. As opposed to continuing to, oh, I really want to do a ministry. Oh, I really want to do this. And just talking about it, just having it be some vain thought at the end of the day if I don't ever do anything about it. It needs to be done. And, and you know what? I decided, no, I really want to do this and follow through with it. And now we're set up to, to have a ministry. Praise God. I'm glad that we have another ministry. And look, this isn't, you know, hopefully you get this the right way. I'm not just trying to say why I'm so spiritual and awesome. No, I've passed up so many other opportunities that I've had along the way. It's something that I'm trying to relate to you that I know what it's like to feel this, but we need to overcome these urges and these reasons to not do these things that we do really want to do in ways that we really want to serve God. Let's overcome that last hurdle and, and just act. You say, well, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to make that change now. I'm sick of just thinking about it. I'm sick of just of, of even vaguely remembering these things every once in a while. I'm going to put it to the forefront and I'm going to act on it. I'm going to make sure it gets done. I don't know exactly how it's going to get done right now, but I'm going to start moving forward on it and it will get done. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, all the words of encouragement we could find throughout the Bible. Lord, I pray that you would please help us to get our hearts right, to, to be um, willing to, to suffer a little bit. I mean, even if it's just so it's real basic suffering of just, of just making things work in our schedule or, or whatever the case may be, dear Lord. Help us to, to overcome our flesh that wants to be lazy and to not get anything done. Lord, help us to evaluate our own priorities and to continually push ourselves to make sure that we're not going to be ashamed, that we're not going to be dissatisfied with the service that we had done for you in the short period of time that we are on this earth. Lord, help us to... You know, no matter what we've done in the past, as far as our time is concerned, God, help us to use our time starting today and moving forward to, to make sure that our priorities are reflected and our service to you um, is increased. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.